Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the November webinar for Community IT Innovators. It's titled Improving Donor Data, a Real Life Story. And this month's webinar is presented in partnership with Build Consulting. A couple of housekeeping notes before we get started. Uh, feel free to ask questions via chat. We'll leave some time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. Uh, try to avoid multitasking. You may just miss the best part of the presentation. And finally, the uh, webinar recording and slides will be available after the webinar, and we will share them with all registrants. A little bit about Build Consulting and Community IT. We both work exclusively with nonprofit organizations to help make them help them make information technology and information systems decisions that support their mission. We uh, have a collaborative approach, and our goal is to empower our clients to make informed choices for their organizations. My name is Peter Miras, and I'm a partner at Build Consulting. At Build, I serve nonprofit organizations as a part-time chief information officer and a project leader for data and technology initiatives. Clients I have worked with include such as the Humane Society of the United States and NeighborWorks America. Build Consulting leads in the social good sector by providing three different types of services. Um, the first is the Build CIO offering where we serve as part-time or interim chief information officers for nonprofits. Uh, the second is Build Projects where we perform business process, technology, and data projects ranging from strategic assessments and tech roadmaps to system selections and implementations. And finally, with Build Teams, we provide outsourced data managers that have deep development operations experience as well as nonprofit CRM expertise. And it's from these services and providing them over a prolonged period of time with a wide range of nonprofit organizations that we derive the insight to uh, fund, so to speak, a presentation such as this. And now let's get into today's story, which is about improving donor data. It's a real life story. Um, and let's tell you a little bit about the organization itself. It is a 15 year old nonprofit with a niche of providing news and analysis related to a range of cultural issues. Um, they're chosen for this story because the challenges that they faced and the solutions they applied are relevant to all sizes of nonprofits and the solutions applied are transferable to small and large environments. To give you some sense of what they were looking at in terms of constituent base, 4.5 million potential constituents, which was the figure that was determined based on the number of recurring information consumers across all of their channels, both traditional and digital. Uh, 55,000 known constituents, and by known I mean we had at least the full name and at least one method of direct communication with them. 45,000 of those 55,000 were subscribers to a free uh, email delivered information service, um, and roughly 4,000 donors, 2,000 of which had been active within the past year as we started this initiative. And what they wanted to accomplish? Well, it wasn't that dissimilar from what a lot of nonprofits want to accomplish in bottom line when they're approaching a donor data improvement project. Um, they wanted to increase overall revenue, as we all do. Uh, they wanted to smooth out cash flow peaks and valleys, um, meaning that there were certain times of year when they were feeling a, a lot of stress because of the major uh, time intervals between their fundraising campaigns. So they wanted to try to ease that a little bit. And in doing these kinds of things, they also wanted to reduce stress on donors and fundraisers. Um, there's a lot of donor fatigue and a lot of fundraising fatigue. So how do we go about doing that? Yeah, there's, there's three parts to the story. Uh, first, just sort of clearing for action. What we thought was necessary to do an assessment and get everybody on the same page. The second part was actually taking action. Uh, and I will go through all of the some of the different things that they did to improve their donor data, donor data and some of the things that they were able to do as a result of that. And then assessing impact. I mean, from a bottom line standpoint, what did they get out of it? So this story includes all of those things. Uh, shouldn't take too long to get through, and hopefully you find it compelling and interesting and related to your challenges. So in the first part, clearing for action. What did we do? What was important here? 
Now, the first thing we needed to do is decrease the noise in the database. A um, lot of information in the database, not all of it was relevant. Uh, cleaning it up, uh, getting into shape was necessary in order to determine what was really there and what wasn't. Uh, they needed to better know their constituents. Um, they needed to learn about best practices and engagement and giving trends and develop a plan and build consensus internally. So let's step through each of those a little bit in detail, starting with decreasing the noise in the database. The first thing that they did was use queries to pull the data out of the constituent database, um, and that's constituent activity and transaction records. Uh, and they pulled it out into CSV files, and then they did the analysis in Excel and Power BI. Um, this offered them a, a better view into the data that they had than their current system allowed. Um, and so it was necessary to move the data outside of the system to get a real clear view of it, particularly when it came to quality. Uh, so analyze, that, that data was analyzed using a range of criteria. Um, and then we used the findings from that analysis to do a number of different things. The first thing was just eliminate or consolidate duplicative records. Uh, that was a process in and of itself. It was stepped through in prioritized fashion. Uh, based on the level of certainty uh, that we had a duplicate record and the importance of that constituent to the organization. We eliminated outdated constituent and gift coding, custom attributes, notes, anything that was no longer going to be relevant or didn't hold any value. And to that point, it was just about eliminating non-necessary data that was so inconsistently collected in the past that it served as no better than what we sometimes call ANIC data moving forward. Um, the data was purged from the system and preserved only in a written narrative, which was outside of the database. And that narrative just spoke to what or might or might not be reasonably inferred from that data, if anything. And all the data that was archived from the database, all the data that was eliminated from the database was archived in CSV files. So what did that result in? Well, it resulted in a clean set of constituent data from which to generate accurate reports reports that were not needing to be filtered, merged, or otherwise adjusted to account for the junk in the database. And that resulted in an honest view of what could be reasonably known about the constituents individually and as a whole from the data that was available. The second step was learning more about the constituents. Um, so once you had a good idea of what was in the database, you kind of knew what you knew and didn't know about the constituents. Um, and previously, the organization had been frustrated trying to learn more about their constituents because they thought that they needed to store, gather all of that information directly from the full constituent group and store it all on the constituent records. Uh, what we ended up doing was taking a different approach where we surveyed constituents to determine engagement behaviors, giving behaviors, the value proposition that the organization presented to its constituents, uh, everything from that ranging to their emotional needs to how likely they were to refer the organization to another potential constituent, all those different kinds of things. And then we inform that information with demographic and constituent behavior data from sources that are readily available, such as Google Analytics and Quantcast. And in addition to that, we helped develop a group of 30 key constituent stakeholders, which included top donors and other high engagement and or well-connected constituents to provide additional input and achieve buy-in from them on future direction. Um, so again, these are things that any organization could do. It doesn't necessarily have to be costly or time consuming. It just takes a little know-how and uh, you can learn these things and use them to drive your strategy and, and determine where to better improve your donor data as a result. And then of course, in addition to learning what you can directly from your constituents and, and their behaviors, you kind of want to combine that with what the best practices are from the industry, focused on such things as moving non-donors to donate, turning one-time or annual donors into monthly sustainers, increasing giving commitments, et cetera. Um, and so uh, there was a combination of, again, learning directly from the constituents themselves, but not in a way that required uh, storing more data on the constituent record, and then just sort of informing that with best practices. And finally, uh, you know, we socialized the findings internally. 
the outputs from the previous steps took much of the guesswork out of what the organization needed to do moving forward forward in terms of its marketing strategy in terms of its program alignment to uh, to constituent needs and in terms of its development strategy uh, and in in ways both obvious and subtle uh, going through a discovery process like that increased accountability because it highlighted where ego, personal preferences, hunches, or convenience were driving donor data decisions rather than best practices and the data itself. And because the findings from the analysis were well-documented and socialized, the result was that board members, executives, staff, and even key constituent stakeholders were all on board. And that's what's really necessary to have uh, good donor data within an organization. It's cultural to a large extent. And without the culture being right, it's hard to implement the processes and the discipline and the systems that are necessary to do those kinds of things. So then we get to the action part. So that, that whole first part was just about clearing the decks and making sure everybody was on board with direction. And as I said, we align marketing development and programs to better serve the constituents. But today, because this is about improving donor data, we're just gonna be focused on development specific examples. So you can see here on the screen, some of the things that uh, we focused on. Uh, there are many things, and these are just highlights, uh, and we're going to step through each of them in turn, so I'm not going to read through what's on the screen here. So the first thing that we really needed to do was reduce friction in the sort of subscription or registration and donation processes. Um, so a couple things that we did there. One. We stripped the donation forms and the online registration forms down to their bare essentials and aligned them to industry best practices to achieve better conversion percentages. That was informed in part by what we learned about the demographics of our audience, um, uh, how they were engaging online, uh, et cetera. Um, so it was best practice based, but also tuned to this particular organization and its constituency. Previously, uh, in the organization's history, competing interests from marketing and development that weren't grounded enough in industry best practices had resulted in a lot of fields being added to subscription and donation forms because that was viewed as the primary way that you could gather information about constituents. Um, that just way increased the friction and decreased conversion rates. Um, the good news was that the survey data that we did in the previous, that we gathered in the previous phase provided enough direction to make gathering most of this information on a per constituent basis completely unnecessary. Um, or there would be opportunities later on to get that information from the most critical uh, relationships. Um, so th that, those were critical things that we did to reduce friction. The second thing, and this was actually a big thing, was better handling of potential fraudulent transactions. Um, there's a lot of attempted fraud online these days, a lot of bots trying to hit your donation forms. And so that not only uh, presents some technical challenges, but it also can result in a lot of additional account management work for develop developers and fundraisers, uh, as well as a lot of uh, need to do handle chargebacks and things of that nature for when fraudulent transactions are successful. So we changed the payment gateway, that was key, um, because the one that the organization had before didn't have good fraud reduction or prevention controls. Um, so we moved to a better payment gateway with better and more configurable anti-fraud mechanisms. Uh, we also integrated some predictive analytics into the donation form, and that those two steps resulted in a couple of benefits. One was fewer false positives and fraud detection. Uh, one of the things that we learned from surveying the constituents was that we had some foreign donors in Asia that were, uh, were had a strong preference for being able to make large donations on credit cards. Um, and they had not been able to do so previously because the uh, payment gateway was falsely identifying them as uh, fraudulent attempts. Uh, so we eliminated friction for some major donors who were trying to put some sizable uh, multi-thousand dollar individual gifts on the credit cards. 
And so we reduce the amount of false positives, but also reduce the number of uh, fraudulent transactions allowed. And that dramatically increased the number of chargebacks and refunds, excuse me, decreased the number of chargebacks and refunds, and also eliminated the number of junk transaction records that were getting into the database or dramatically reduce them. The third example is just pushing the right call to action. Um, on digital properties, we shifted the priority to getting people to register for a free information service rather than getting them to donate. Uh, data indicated that with certain changes to use of promotional real estate or call to action and available spaces on the website and social media channels, the subscription conversion rates would increase. Um, uh, you might think of this as newsletter registration. Uh, so why did we do that? Well, the data also indicated that the organization was much more likely to get a donation from an information service subscriber than a non-subscriber. And that was because it entered the person into a value-based dialogue or exchange of information with the organization, having a minimal amount of personal information combined with some behavior data from other sources allowed for more personal fundraising messaging. So the key was not to get people to donate, as their first action, but to get them to provide some information and engage in a relationship. And then they were much more likely to donate. Uh, we also did better data, donor data analysis and segmentation. This was only possible to do reliably because of the way that the donor data had been cleaned up um, and some new tools that were implemented. It helped to identify one-time or annual donors that might be converted to monthly sustainer donors allowed us to direct more personal messages encouraging uh, donors to pledge a recurring monthly amount representing a slight increase over their previous giving levels, helped to ID major donors that might be willing to provide funds for matching campaigns, and also identified high engagement non-donor constituents and help engage them in personal dialogue about becoming donors. Uh, and overall, we used the analysis of what the constituents wanted plus improved segmentation and analysis of the donor data that we had to make fundraising communications less frequent, more targeted, and more value oriented. So we did work on improving integration and process automation. Part of that was about tightening the integration between the CARM and online marketing tools um, for better end-to-end -end tracking and analysis of online engagement. Um, we also streamlined the process for constituent records management for data managers and improved the donors and constituents' ability to self-service their accounts or profiles online. And we also used um, automation to predict constituent and donor readiness to deepen the relationship based on their actions and then elevate that indication of development's awareness for further cultivation. And uh, we simplified the process for processing refunds and making gift adjustments. So those were all uh, under the integration and automation heading. So much more that could be said there, but those are some of the highlights. And then finally, and this is sometimes the most difficult thing to accomplish at an organization, is what, it, what the data management was like moving forward over a prolonged period of time. So you want to come up with processes and then consistently apply them. So why was this easier to do? For one thing, everybody in the organization was on board, whereas they hadn't been previously. Uh, we had consistent application of fewer and better defined constituent gifting campaign codes, which helped to simplify things for folks and improve reporting accuracy. More consistent use of actions inside of the system and less frequent use of notes on constituent records. Um, and the benefit of that was that people are now taking the time to record that data in more appropriate and more reportable fields on the constituent record rather than in notes. And in general, more careful and consistent use of tools to keep the constituent data clean, to minimize the amount of incorrect data in the system, to keep it duplicate free, or at least as duplicate free as reasonable. And now we're gonna talk a little bit about outcomes and then move forward to questions. So what did this get us? What did all of this work, these months of labor in this process get us? Well, the first thing was that we, we one of the goals was to increase revenue. We did that. Um, average revenue increased in each of the next three years with uh, by 10.5%. 
um, with the biggest boost, 15% occurring in the first year post implementation of this plan. Um, so those are good results. Uh, again, that's 10.5% on average year over year across the three year time span. The second goal was to um, smooth out the cash flow. Uh, certain months of the year, as everybody knows in fundraising, are harder to fundraise than others. You're going to have some months that pale in comparison to your peaks. Um, July is just such a month. So I'm using that as an example here. We're able to increase monthly revenue in other months as well, but July as an example um, was I had a first year increase of 30% over previous years, and that was sustained with additional slight increases of a couple of percent over the next each of the next two years. And this probably was the biggest thing, increasing donor and organizational happiness, um, streamlining the fundraising messages, making them more confident and value oriented, uh, et cetera, uh, was a real relief to the donors. Um, they wanted to hear from the organization, but they didn't want to be on the receiving end of a beg quite so much. Uh, didn't want to quite be as pounded as much with fundraising messages. So a lot of stuff that we could do there to improve their happiness and the results in follow-up surveys proved that we were successful in that. And increasing revenue and improved cash flow and creating greater trust in the strategy and the process and the data resulted in development being able to spend more time in productive dialogue with donors and less time on customer service and records management and trying to tease accuracy out of the data and reports. So all of these things led to a more cheery, bright outlook, greater staff energy, and the creativity and energy uh, that came from that led to continued innovations, to continued advancing standards for donor data moving forward. So this is just a brief story, obviously. Uh, there's a lot more that could be said about what was done with this client, what they achieved, and, um, and the outcomes. Uh, but that's as much as we can cover productively for for this day. If you have any, uh, if you'd like to hear more about this story, feel free to reach out to us. And also, I'll just go ahead and answer any questions that you might have. So let me see what's been posted so far. So the question is, how did we get the organization to prioritize this work, which probably took quite a bit of their time to implement? That is a great question. Um, I think that there was just a mounting frustration inside of the organization, that the situation was broke and they needed to fix it. And in general sense, partly from new people coming into the organization, that they could be doing better. Um, that pain was so acute that it resulted in increased turnover. It finally got to such a problem that the executives in the organization could no longer afford to ignore the situation. Um, and it's not that they were disinterested. Before, they were just focused on other things, um, mostly on program delivery. So uh, it was took some ed time and education and to get the buy-in. But again, doing some of these assessment or analysis projects up front, if the organization is open to doing that, can do a lot to get everybody on the same page because doing a survey of constituents, for example, and then asking similar questions of internal team members is a good opportunity to find out whether the internal team's perceptions of the constituents and the landscape is the same or equivalent to the, the external constituents' perspectives. Um, so that creates a lot of aha moments and helps to create buy-in for the additional energy. Another question here is, um, I believe you said asking a target audience for personal information first before extending and ask for money increases the chances of them donating. Could you elaborate on that? What does that look like in a giving campaign run via social media, for example? Um, I think the, I'll, I could elaborate it a little bit on it by saying that a lot of organizations, particularly that run a little bit more hand to mouth from a financial standpoint, are general, generally focused on the imperative of making the initial ask a money ask. And um, that's just not the reality of how most of us engage in relationships. Um, if somebody came up to you on the street 
and presented you with a very minimal amount of information and said, hey, would you like to hand me five dollars? The answer is probably going to be, you know, thanks, but but I just met you. And that would probably be the polite version of the answer. Um, so the, generally speaking, putting the constituents in the situation where you're exchanging something of value, getting them into sort of a conversation uh, with you, even if that's mostly on them being on the at receiving out of a broadcast uh, gives them an opportunity to take an action and then you can follow up after having provided that value with an additional request. Um, so it's just about sequencing and, and moving the constituent through a journey that they can appreciate that provides them with value of some sort, what, regardless of what that might be. Uh, and you can pursue the same step through social media. Uh, making sure that you initiate the conversation based on a mutual exchange of value before taking it into the ask phase. Yeah. Um, another one of the questions that we got uh, before the uh, uh, start of the webinar was, how do you convince executives to pay attention to this kind of stuff? Um, and I've already spoke to that question a little bit, but so specifically, what can you do to help convince uh, executives or higher ups inside the organization? Well, you could share the story with them. Uh, you could find other stories that demonstrate how better donor data can lead to improved outcomes. Where possible, identify clear, relatable industry benchmarks that help support the case for change or statistics from case stories such as those that I've shared today. Um, that could help to make the case for change. Um, another question that we received early on is, is improving donor data expensive? That's a great question. The answer is that it can be very expensive, uh, but having a, a lot of having good donor data relies on culture. The willingness to be informed by best practices and the discipline to apply them internally. So. Technology is rarely the only problem, and sometimes it isn't a problem at all. Uh, it starts with leadership and organizational culture, and getting that right can dramatically reduce the costs of, of that come downstream. Uh, so there are a lot of ways that you can control costs and data improvement processes, um, but there are solutions, um, even if they won't get you all the way there for all sizes of organizations and all different kinds of budgets. Um, uh, there is always something that can be done to improve the donor data. Uh, and I think that this case story was an example. This client wasn't using sophisticated systems. Um, they were using custom homegrown solutions with limited functionality. And that presented some challenges in terms of limiting the number of features available to do the data cleanup. Um, the compensation for that was that it gave more direct access to the constituent data in the database. Um, but in general, this case story is indic indicative of what an organization can do without spending a lot of money. Um, there was very little expense spent relative to the benefit. And we've seen similar projects done without a lot of expense, uh, you know, cash outlay, so to speak, in the Razor's Edge, Donor Perfect, Salesforce, and other CRM systems. So, yes, these projects can be expensive. Um, but that was not the case for this particular case story, although it did require some internal time and a little help from outside consultants. Um, but it was not a critical uh, expense for the organization. It was easily absorbed into their budget. So those are all the questions that were posted. And we're currently at time for this webinar. Uh, we've been trying to keep them shorter, at least once per quarter, to uh, to, so you make it easier for you to work it into your schedule. Again, if you have any follow-up questions or anything that you'd like to discuss, please uh, reach out to us. You can reach us at, at, on Twitter at Build Consulting or at the Community IT Twitter. Um, you can also go to the communityit.com website or thisisbuild.com and use the contact forms. So thanks, everybody, for participating today. It was great to spend this time with you. I hope you got value out of it, and have a great day.